the life of george wilhelm friedrich hegel by j lowenberg ph d assistant in philosophy harvard university from the german classics of the nineteenth and twentieth centuries published in nineteen thirteen and nineteen fourteen among students of philosophy the mention of hegel's name arouses at once a definite emotion few thinkers indeed have ever so completely fascinated the minds of their sympathetic readers or have so violently repulsed their unwilling listeners as hegel has to his followers hegel is the true prophet of the only true philosophic creed to his opponents, he has, in Professor James's words, quote, like Byron's Corsair, left a name to other times, linked with one virtue and a thousand crimes. End quote. The feelings of attraction to Hegel or repulsion from him do not emanate from his personality. Unlike Spinoza's, his life offers nothing to stir the imagination. Briefly, some of his biographical data are as follows. He was born at Stuttgart, the capital of Württemberg, August 27, 1770. His father was a government official, and the family belonged to the upper middle class. Hegel received his early education at the Latin school and the gymnasium of his native town. At both these institutions, as well as at the University of Tübingen, which he entered in 1788 to study theology, he distinguished himself as an eminently industrious, but not as a rarely gifted student. The certificate which he received upon leaving the university in 1793 speaks of his good character, his meritorious acquaintance with theology and languages, and his meager knowledge of philosophy. This does not quite represent his equipment, however, for his private reading and studies carried him far beyond the limits of the regular curriculum. After leaving the university, he spent several years as family tutor in Switzerland and in Frankfurt on the Main. Soon after, in 1801, we find him as Privat Docent, then, in 1805, as professor at the University of Jena. His academic activities were interrupted by the Battle of Jena. For the next two years, we meet him as an editor of a political journal at Bomberg, and from 1808 to 1816, as rector of the gymnasium at Nuremberg. He was then called to a professorship of philosophy at Heidelberg. In 1818, he was called to Berlin to fill the vacancy left by the death of Fichte. From this time on, until his death in 1831, he was the recognized dictator of one of the most powerful philosophic schools in the history of thought. It is no easy task to convey an adequate idea of Hegel's philosophy within the limits of a short introduction. There is, however, one central thought animating the vast range of his whole philosophic system, which permits of non-technical statement. This thought will be more easily grasped if we consider first the well-known concept of permanence and change. They may be said to constitute the most fundamental distinction in life and in thought. Religion and poetry have always dwelt upon their tragic meaning, that there is nothing new under the sun, and that we are but, quote, fair creatures of an hour, end quote, in an ever-changing world, are equally sad reflections. Interesting is the application of the difference between permanence and change to extreme types of temperament. We may speak loosely of the, quote, static, end quote, and the, quote, dynamic, end quote, temperaments, the former clinging to everything that is traditional, conservative, and abiding in art, religion, philosophy, politics, and life, the latter 
everywhere pointing to and delighting in the fluent the novel the effervescent these extreme types by no means rare or unreal illustrate the deep-rooted need of investigating either temperaments or change with a more fundamental value and to the value of the one or the other philosophers have always endeavored to give metaphysical expression some thinkers have proclaimed change to be the deepest manifestation of reality while others have insisted upon something abiding behind a world of flux the question whether change or permanence is more essential arose early in greek philosophy heraclitus was the first one to see in change a deeper significance than in the permanence of the Iliadics. A more dramatic opposition than the one which ensued between the Heracletians and the Iliadics can scarcely be imagined. Both schools claiming a monopoly of reason and truth, both distrusting the senses, and each charging the other with illusion. Now the significance of Hegel's philosophy can be grasped only when we bear in mind that it was just this profound distinction between the permanent and the changing that Hegel sought to understand and to interpret. He saw more deeply into the reality of movement and change than any other philosopher before or after him. Very early in his life, judging by the recently published writings of his youth, Hegel became interested in various phases of movement and change the vicissitudes of his own inner and outer life he did not analyze he was not given to introspection romanticism and mysticism were foreign to his nature his temperament was rather that of the objective thinker not his own passions hopes and fears but those of others invited his curiosity with an humane attitude the young hegel approached religious and historical problems the dramatic life and death of jesus the tragic fate of quote, the glory of that greece and the grandeur of that rome end quote. the discrepancies between christ's teachings and the positive christian religion the fall of paganism and the triumph of the christian church these were the problems over which the young hegel pondered through an intense study of these problems he discovered that evil, sin, longing, and suffering are woven into the very tissue of religious and historical processes, and that these negative elements determine the very meaning and progress of history and religion. Thereupon he began a systematic sketch of a philosophy in which a negative factor was to be recognized as the positive vehicle in the development of the whole world. And thus his genius came upon a method which revealed to him an orderly unfolding in the world with stages of relative values, the higher developing from the lower, and all stages constituting the organic whole. The method which the young Hegel discovered empirically, and which the mature rationalist applied to every sphere of human life and thought, is the famous dialectical method, capital D, capital M. This method is, in general, nothing else than the recognition of the necessary presence of a negative factor in the constitution of the world. Everything in the world be it a religious cult or a logical category, a human passion or a scientific law, is, so Hegel holds, the result of a process which involves the overcoming of a negative element. Without such an element to overcome, the world would indeed be an inert and irrational affair. That any rational and worthy activity entails the encounter of opposition and the removal of obstacles is an observation commonplace enough. A pre-established harmony of foreseen happy issues, a fool's paradise, is scarcely our ideal of a rational world. Just as a game is not worth playing 
when its result is predetermined by the great inferiority of the opponent, so life, without something negative to overcome, loses its zest. But the process of overcoming is not anything contingent. It operates according to a uniform and universal law. And this law constitutes Hegel's most central doctrine, his doctrine of evolution, with a capital E. In order to bring this doctrine into better relief, it may be well to contrast it superficially with the Darwinian theory of transformation. In general, Hegel's doctrine is a concept of value. Darwin's is not. What Darwinians mean by evolution is not an unfolding of the past, a progressive development of a hierarchy of phases in which the latter is superior and organically related to the earlier. No sufficient criterion is provided by them for evaluating the various stages in the course of an evolutionary process. The biologist's world would probably have been just as rational if the famous ape-like progenitor of man had chanced to become his offspring, assuming an original environment favored for such a transformation. Some criterion besides the mere external and accidental, quote, struggle for existence, end quote, and, quote, survival of the fittest, end quote, must be furnished to account for a progressive evolution. Does the phrase, quote, survival of the fittest, end quote, say much more than that those who happen to survive are the fittest, or that their survival proves their fitness? But this survival itself is valuable. That it is better to be alive than dead, that existence has a value other than itself, that what comes later in the history of the race or of the universe is an advance over what went before, that, in a word, the world is subject to an imminent development, only a comprehensive and systematic philosophy can attempt to show. The task of Hegel's whole philosophy consists in showing, by means of one uniform principle, that the world manifests everywhere a genuine evolution. Unlike the participants in the biological, quote, struggle for existence, end quote, the struggling beings in Hegel's universe never end in slaying, but in reconciliation. Their very struggle gives birth to a new being, which includes them, and this being is, quote, higher, end quote, in the scale of existence because it represents the preservation of the two mutually opposed beings. Only where conflicts are adjusted, oppositions overcome, negations removed, is their advance, in Hegel's sense, and only where there is a passage from the positive through its challenging negative to a higher form inclusive of both, is there a case of real development. The ordinary process of learning by experience illustrates somewhat Hegel's meaning. An individual finds himself, for some instance, in the presence of a wholly new institution that elicits an immediate, definite reaction. In his ignorance, he chooses the wrong mode of behavior. As a consequence, trouble ensues, feelings are hurt, pride is wounded, motives are misconstrued, Embittered and disappointed with himself, he experiences great mental sorrow. But he soon learns to see the situation in its true light. He condemns his deeds and offers to make amends. And after the wounds begin to heal, the inner struggles experienced commence to assume a positive worth. They have led him to a deeper insight of his own motives to a better self-comprehension. And he finally comes forth from the whole affair enriched and enlightened. Now in this formal example, to which any context may be supplied, three phases can be distinguished. First we have the person as he meant to be in the presence of the new situation, unaware of trouble, 
then his wrong reaction engendered a hostile element he was at war with himself he was not what he meant to be and finally he returned to himself richer and wiser including with himself the negative experience as a valuable asset in the advancement of his development this process of falling away from oneself of facing oneself as an enemy whom one reconciles to and includes in one's larger self is certainly a familiar process it is a process just like this that develops one's personality however the self may be defined metaphysically it is for every self-conscious individual a never-ceasing battle with conflicting motives and antagonistic desires a never-ending cycle of endeavor failure and success through the very agency of failure the more typical instances of this rhythmic process is hegel's view of the evolution of religion religion in general is based on a dualism which it seeks to overcome though god is in heaven and man on earth religion longs to separate the gulf which separates man and god the religions of the orient emphasize god's infinity god is everything man is nothing like an oriental prince god is conceived to have despotic sway over man his creature only in contemplating god's omnipotence and his own nothingness can man find solace and peace opposed to this religion of the infinite is the finite religion of greece man in greece stands in the center of a beautiful cosmos which is not alien to his spirit the gods on high conceived after the likeness of man are the expression of a free people conscious of their freedom and the divinities worshipped under the form of zeus apollo aphrodite what are they but idealized and glorified greeks can a more complete antithesis be imagined but christianity becomes possible after this struggle only for in christianity is contained both the principle of oriental infinity and the element of hellenic finitude for in a being who is both god and man a god-man the gulf between the infinite and the finite is bridged the christian like the greek worships man jesus but this man is one with the eternal being of the orient because it is the outcome of the oriental and the greek opposition the christian religion is in hegel's sense a higher one viewing the oriental and the hellenic religions historically in terms of the biological quote, struggle for existence end quote, the extinction of neither has resulted the christian religion is the unity of these two struggling opposites in it they are conciliated and preserved and this for hegel is a genuine evolution that evolution demands a union of opposites seems at first paradoxical enough to say that christianity is a religion of both infinity and finitude means nothing less than that it contains a contradiction hegel's view strange as it may sound is just this everything includes a contradiction in it everything is both positive and negative everything expresses at once its everlasting yea and its everlasting no both everlasting yea and everlasting no are capitalized the negative character of the world is the very vehicle of its progress life and activity mean the triumph of the positive over the negative a triumph which results from absorbing and assimilating it the myth of the phoenix typifies the life of reason quote, eternally preparing for itself end quote. as hegel says quote, a funeral pile and consuming upon itself but so that from its ashes it produces the new renovated fresh life end quote. that the power of negativity 
enters constitutively in the rationality of the world nay that the rationality of the world demands negativity in it is hegel's most original contribution to thought his complete philosophy is the attempt to show in detail that the whole universe and everything it contains manifests the process of uniformly struggling with a negative power and is an outcome of conflicting but reconciled forces an impressionistic picture of the world's eternal becoming through this process is furnished by the first of hegel's great works the phenomenology of the spirit the book is in a sense a cross-section of the entire spiritual world it depicts the necessary unfolding of typical phases of the spiritual life of mankind logical categories scientific laws historical epochs literary tendencies religious processes social moral and artistic institutions all exemplify the same onward movement through a union of opposites there is eternal and total instability everywhere but this unrest and instability is of a necessary and uniform nature according to the one eternally fixed principle which renders the universe as a whole organic and orderly organic wholeness this phase contains the rationale of the restless flow and the evanescent being of the hegelian world it is but from the point of view of the whole that its countless conflicts discrepancies and contradictions can be understood as the members of the body find only in the body as a whole the raison d'etre reason for being so the manifold expressions of the world are the expressions of one organism a hand which is cut off as hegel somewhere remarks still looks like a hand and exists but it is not a real hand similarly any part of the world severed from its connection with the whole any isolated historical event any one religious view any particular scientific explanation any single social body any mere individual person is like an amputated bodily organ hegel's view of the world as organic depends upon exhibiting the partial and abstract nature of other views in his phenomenology a variety of interpretations of the world and of the meaning and destiny of life are scrutinized as to their adequacy and concreteness when not challenged the point of view of common sense for instance seems concrete and natural the reaction of common sense to the world is direct and practical it has few questions to ask and philosophical speculations appear to it abstract and barren but upon analysis it is the common sense view that stands revealed as abstract and barren for an abstract object is one that does not fully correspond to the rich and manifold reality it is incomplete and one-sided precisely such an object is the world of common sense its concreteness is ignorance there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of by common sense it's a workaday world it's not even a faint reflex of the vast and complex universe it sees but the immediate the obvious the superficial so instead of being concrete it is in truth the very opposite nor is empirical science with its predilection for quote, facts end quote, better off every science able to cope with a mere fragmentary aspect of the world and from a partial point of view is forced to ignore much of the concrete content of even its own realm likewise art and religion though in their views more synthetic and therefore more concrete are one-sided they seek to satisfy special needs philosophy alone hegelian philosophy is concrete its aim is to interpret the world in its entirety and complexity 
Its ideal is to harmonize the demands of common sense, the interests of science, the appeal of art, and the longing of religion into one coherent whole. This view of philosophy, because it deals with the universe in its fullness and variety, alone can make claim to real concreteness. Nor are the other views false. They form for Hegel the necessary rungs on the ladder, which leads up to his own philosophic vision. Thus the Hegelian vision is itself an organic process, including all other interpretations of life and of the world as its necessary phases. In the imminent unfolding of the Hegelian view is epitomized the onward march and the organic unity of the world spirit itself. World and spirit are both capitalized. The technical formulation of this view is contained in his logic. This book may indeed be said to be Hegel's master stroke. Nothing less is attempted in it than the proof that the very process of reasoning manifests the same principle of evolution through a union of opposites. Hegel was well aware, as much as recent exponents of anti-intellectualism, that through, quote, static, end quote, concepts we transmute and falsify the, quote, fluent, End quote, reality. As Professor James says, quote, the essence of life is its continuously changing character, but our concepts are all discontinuous and fixed. When we conceptualize, we cut out and fix and exclude everything but what we have fixed. A concept means a that and no other. End quote that and no other in italics but are our concepts static fixed and discontinuous what if the very concepts we employ in reasoning should exemplify the universal flow of life hegel finds that indeed to be the case concepts we daily use such as quality and quantity essence and phenomenon appearance and reality matter and force cause and effect are not fixed and isolated entities but form a continuous system of interdependent elements stated dogmatically the meaning is this as concavity and convexity are inseparably connected though one is the very opposite of the other as one cannot so to speak live without the other both being always found in union, so can no concept be discovered that is not thus wedded to a contradiction. Every concept develops upon analysis a stubbornly negative mate. No concept is statable or definable without its opposite. One involves the other. One cannot speak of motion without implying rest. One cannot mention the finite without at the same time referring to the infinite. One cannot define cause without explicitly defining effect. Not only is this true, but concepts, when applied, reveal perpetual oscillation. Take the terms north and south. The mention of the North Pole, for example, implies at once the South Pole also. It can be distinguished only by contrast with the other, which it thus includes. But it is a North Pole only by excluding the South Pole from itself, by being itself, and not merely what the other is not. The situation is paradoxical enough. Each aspect, the negative or the positive, of anything appears to exclude the other, while each requires its own other for its very definition and expression. It needs the other, and yet is independent of it. How Hegel proves this, of all concepts, cannot here be shown. The result is that no concept can be taken by itself as a, quote, that and no other, end quote. It is perpetually accompanied by its other, as man is by his shadow. 
the attempt to isolate any logical category and regard it as fixed and stable thus proves futile each category to show this as the task of hegel's logic is itself an organism the result of a process which takes place within its inner constitution and all logical categories inevitably used in describing and explaining our world form one system of interdependent and organically related parts hegel begins with an analysis of a concept that most abstractly describes reality follows it through its countless conflicts and contradictions and finally reaches the highest category which including all the foregoing categories in organic unity is alone adequate to characterize the universe as an organism what these categories are and what hegel's procedure is in showing their necessary sequential development can here not even be hinted at that the logical development of the categories of thought is the same as the historical evolution of life and vice versa establishes for hegel the identity of thought and reality in the history of philosophy the discrepancy between thought and reality has often been emphasized there are those who insist that reality is too vast and too deep for man with his limited vision to penetrate others again who set only certain bounds to man's understanding reality in the history of philosophy the discrepancy be parts and others still who see in the very shifts and changes of philosophic and scientific opinion the delusion of reason and the elusiveness of reality the history of thought certainly does present an array of conflicting views concerning the limits of human reason but all the contradictions and conflicts of thought prove to hegel the sovereignty of reason the conflicts of reason are its own necessary processes and expressions its dialectic instability is instability that is peculiar to all reality both thought and reality manifest one nature and one process hence reason with its quote, dynamic end quote, categories can comprehend the quote, fluent end quote, reality because it is flesh of its flesh and bone of its bone hegel's bold and oft quoted words quote, what is rational is real and what is real is rational end quote pithily express his whole doctrine the nature of rationality and the nature of reality are for hegel one and the same spiritual process the organic process of triumphing over and conquering conflicts and contradictions where reality conforms to this process it is rational in parenthesis that which does not conform to it is not reality at all but has like an amputated leg mere contingent existence in parenthesis the logical formula of this process is but an abstract account of what reality is in its essence the equation of the real and the rational or the discovery of one significant process underlying both life and reason led hegel to proclaim a new kind of logic so well characterized by professor royce as the quote, logic of passion end quote. to repeat what has been said above this means that categories are related to one another as historical epochs as religious processes as social and moral institutions nay as human passions wills and deeds are related to one another mutual conflict and contradiction appear as their sole constant factor amid all their variable conditions the introduction of contradiction into logical concepts as their sine qua non meant indeed a revolutionary departure from traditional logic prior to hegel 
logical reasoning was reasoning in accordance with the law of contradiction, i.e., with the assumption that nothing can have at the same time and at the same place contradictory and inconsistent qualities or elements. For Hegel, on the contrary, contradiction is the very moving principle of the world, the pulse of its life. Alle Dinge sind an sich selbst widersprechend, as he drastically says. The deeper reason why Hegel invests contradiction with a positive value lies in the fact that since the nature of everything involves the union of discrepant elements, nothing can bear isolation and independence. Terms, processes, epochs, institutions depend upon one another for their mutual expression and existence. It is impossible to take anything in isolation. But this is just what one does in dealing with the world in art, or in science, in religion, or in business. One is always dealing with error and contradiction, because one is dealing with fragments or bits of life and experience. Hence, and this is Hegel's crowning thought, anything short of the whole universe is inevitably contradictory. In brief, contradiction has the same sting for Hegel as it has for anyone else. Without losing its nature of contradictoriness, contradiction has logically this positive meaning. Since it is an essential element of every partial, isolated, and independent view of experience and thought, one is necessarily led to transcend it and to see the universe in organic wholeness. Thus, as Hegel puts his fundamental idea, quote, the truth is the whole, end quote. Neither things nor categories, neither histories nor religions, neither sciences nor arts express or exhaust by themselves the whole essence of the universe. The essence of the universe is the life of the totality of all things, not their sum as the life of man is not the sum of his bodily and mental functions, the whole man being present in each and all of these, so must the universe be conceived as omnipresent in each of its parts and expressions. This is the significance of Hegel's concept of the universe as an organism, the world spirit, capital W, capital S, Hegel's God, with a capital G, constitutes, thinks, lives, wills, and is all in unity. The evolution of the universe is thus the evolution of God himself, with a capital G. The task of philosophy, then, as Hegel conceives it, is to portray in systematic form the evolution of the world spirit in all its necessary ramifications. These ramifications themselves are conceived as constituting complete wholes, such as logic, nature, mind, society, history, art, religion, philosophy, so that the universe in its onward march through these is represented as a whole of wholes. Both W's in those words are capitalized. Ein Kris van Kriesen in Hegel's complete philosophy, each of these special spheres finds its proper place in elaborate treatment. Whether Hegel has, well or ill, succeeded in the task of exhibiting in each and all of these spheres the one universal movement, whether or no he was justified in reading into logic the same kind of development manifested by life or in making life conform to one logical formula, these and other problems should arouse an interest in Hegel's writings. The following selections may give some glimpse of their spirit. In conclusion, 
Some bare suggestions must suffice to indicate the reason for Hegel's great influence. Hegel has partly, if not wholly, created the modern historical spirit. Reality for him, as even this inadequate sketch has shown, is not static, but is essentially a process. Thus, until the history of a thing is known, the thing is not understood at all. It is the becoming, and not the being of the world, that constitutes its reality. And thus, in emphasizing the fact that everything has a past, in quotation marks, the insight into which alone reveals its significant meaning, Hegel has given metaphysical expression and impetus to the awakening modern historical sense. His idea of evolution also epitomizes the spirit of the 19th century, with its search everywhere for genesis and transformations in religion, philology, geology, biology. Closely connected with the predominance of the historical in Hegel's philosophy is its explicit critique of individualism and particularism. According to his doctrine, the individual as individual is meaningless. The particular, independent and unrelated, is an abstraction. The isolation of anything results in contradiction. It is only the whole that animates and gives meaning to the individual and the particular. This idea of subordinating the individual to universal ends is embodied particularly in Hegel's theory of the state, with a capital S, has left its impress upon political, social, and economic theories of his century. Not less significant is the glorification of reason, of which Hegel's complete philosophy is an expression. Reason never spoke with so much self-confidence and authority as it did in Hegel. To the clear vision of reason, the universe presents no dark or mysterious corners. Nay, the very negations and contradictions in it are marks of an inherent rationality. But Hegel's rationalism is not of the ordinary, shallow kind. Reason, he himself, distinguishes from understanding. The latter is analytical. Its function is to abstract, to define, to compile, to classify. Reason, on the other hand, is synthetic, constructive, inventive. Apart from Hegel's special use of the term, it is this synthetic and creative and imaginative quality pervading his whole philosophy which has deepened men's insight into history, religion, and art, and which has yielded its general influence on the philosophic and literary constellation of the 19th century.